Our speaker is an American inventor, technology consultant, author, and speaker. He holds five independently developed patents and has applied for more. Um, his patents are licensed by over 500 corporations that include Apple, Google, Microsoft, and many others. Uh, he holds degrees from the Wharton School and also Harvard University. Please welcome to the stage Mr. Dan Ablo. Thank you, Alessandra, and I'm very excited to be here. We're going to begin the future of devices as a journey that, like many exciting journeys, has a very simple beginning. And this beginning started 10,000 years ago with the discovery of agriculture, the sowing of the first seeds. And then, for nearly all of that 10,000 years, our population was based on agriculture and was very low. But in the year about 1800, just about 200 years ago, something extraordinary happened. And population has grown so much that by today, we have reached seven billion people, and by 2050, the middle of this century, there will be nine billion people on the earth. And the same thing happened with the economy. For nearly 10,000 years, nearly all of human recorded and pre-recorded history, we've been at a very low economic level. But starting about 200 years ago, with the birth of the Industrial Revolution in the United Kingdom, Western Europe, and in America, the United States, which came to be called the West, there came to be something called, that historians call the Great Departure which was the West took off economically. And for 150 years, the West made the mistake of thinking that it was somehow different. Because in the middle of the 1900s began the great convergence. The Industrial Revolution reached the rest of the world in a way that by the year 2050, out of the top four economies in the world, three will not be from the West. It will be China, India, the United States, and then Brazil will be the fourth largest economy in the world. The forecast is that Brazil will have an economy of $10 trillion, four times its growth over today's level of Brazil's economy. And so one of the main reasons for this is literacy. Literacy, which at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, most of the world was illiterate. Today is at 84% around the world, and by the time those children are adults and sitting here in this room, literacy will be over 90% worldwide. And so that ends the first chapter of our journey. It ends the beginning because we have started from very small beginnings, simple beginnings, and then over the last 200 years we have reached greatness. We have grown upwards to enormous greatness but our greatness has become so great that by the year 2050, in just a few short decades, we will have entered what I call the crisis of success. And some of that is because we will have a population of 9 billion people. And those 9 billion people will want to consume so much that they threaten the Earth's biological capacity. And one of the examples of this is that we are out overcrowding the other species on the earth so much that you have probably heard about animal extinctions and fish extinctions, the way we harvest the oceans. And this map shows you plant species extinctions. 20% of the earth's plant species are considered threatened by the humanity's overcrowding of the earth. You've probably also heard about greenhouse gases, climate change, and sea level rises. This is an artist's rendition of a worst case scenario. Everything in South America that is blue and turquoise is underwater. Only the brown and the green remains above sea level. And because we are growing so much, spending, we promise so much to peoples of all countries, spending by government, other kind of spending, 
is causing mushrooming deaths. And because technology is changing the way we work, transforming how we go to work and what happens to many people in their jobs, many people are facing shrinking job prospects. Their opportunity to fulfill their personal potentials and how they work is being reduced in many cases rather than growing. And so there is also income inequality all over the world. And as a result of all of these problems, terrorism is likely to not go away. And one final crisis that comes from our being so successful is that fresh water supplies in many parts of the world will not be enough to meet our agricultural, industrial, and daily living needs. And so I call these the crises of success because there's not going to be some kind of change where we change our infrastructure or how our economy works. There's not going to be a change in what we believe because it's who we are that causes this level of success. We all want more. We want it now, and we're not going to slow down. In fact, when I said that Brazil will grow to be the fourth largest economy with a $10 trillion a year GDP, there was no one here who thought to themselves, no, 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 wait a second, that's too much. I don't want that for me, my kids. I don't want that for the people I know and care about. We all thought, that's great. Let's go for it. Let's do that now. What we really need is, as we realize how great we have become, because we have, and we are, we will continue to do that, we need to find a way to rise to a greater level of success, one that can manage the level of success that we're producing, because this isn't just for 9 billion people over 10 years. This is for an Earth that is increasingly prosperous for centuries to come. We need to think about how to transform, and I call that transformation, the journey to greatness. We need to think about how to transform to an even higher level. We're now beginning the next chapter of this journey, which is mastering greatness. How are we, because we are the ones faced with this, how are we going to master greatness and rise to that next level? And the destination is actually something that you see here in the way that Axis and its people talk about how the new technologies coming. We need to think about the fact that we're becoming a digital planet, a digital Earth that has enormous new capabilities. And can we get there faster? And what can that do for us so that we're actually able to achieve more? As you look around, you certainly can see in your kids and other people's children all of this beginning to happen. We're all surrounded by one and two screens at a time, having lots of new, of new resources and capabilities. And you can really feel through the technologies that you use how fast all of these changes are beginning to arrive. And a good example of how to leap ahead is telephones. Because in telephones, many countries around the world didn't go through all of the steps of all of the landlines and all of the evolution. They just simply went to mobile phones and smartphones. How can we go from A to Z? Why not just build Z? I think, and certainly from having watched everything here, that you, the people here in this room, are already building large parts of tomorrow's world. You're putting in the kinds of cameras, the kinds of connectivity, the network, the bandwidth, the compression. You're putting in the monitoring and the two-way communications are part of that to be able to achieve that. In fact, these projects here are projects right here in South America. And so the real core question is how and when is this going to happen? Let's start with how. About 2007, I started looking at this almost as a detective story. What is coming, how are we going to get there, what are the solutions that are needed? And I worked in confidence and privately for years to look at these kinds of questions and technologies. And just in July, I was in Silicon Valley talking to some of the world's largest and most advanced technology companies. And their reaction to this 
is that this is where the technology industry is headed. There was unanimity. We are headed towards a digital world. And so a quick flash of the Expandiverse technologies is that the column in green is devices. It's how devices fit together and are integrated. The column in yellow is the back-end infrastructure that makes all the pieces work. And in the center are four groups of technologies, technologies for individuals that support you, technologies for groups such as for supporting Access and your companies as you work together. And then the third is human services because over networks, human services can be delivered in many new and powerful ways. And the bottom is global systems. And when you take a quick look at it, this is about this much of binders. It's over 1,500 pages of technology. It's all IP. And we don't have a week to go through it, but that is what's going on. So now let's turn to the first area out of three that we'll just briefly touch on before we move to the bigger picture. And the first is devices. Your devices will know you. Your devices will follow you. Because your devices in 10 years will be a thousand times more powerful than they are today. And in 20 years will be 10,000 times more powerful. Your network, your storage, your bandwidth will also multiply. And so therefore, it'll be like an automatic door. You'll turn to your device, and like when you walk through an automatic door, it opens for you, and then when you're through it, it closes behind you. Your device will recognize you and bring your digital environment to you. And then when you're done and you put it down, and you turn to your next device, it'll restore that to you. But it won't just restore your environment, it'll restore the state of all of the pieces of it. So everything that you are doing, will continue and move with you. It'd be just like walking through that door and the world is, is there waiting for you, it's just real. Well, as you turn to the next screen, it's there waiting for you. It's as real as the physical world. Now, what's going to be on your screen? I call these shared planetary life spaces. And what that means is they are continuous and they include your people, services, places, tools, resources, all the things that you do together. So when you go to work, wherever you are, the people that you work with, and all of the rest of it that you need as tools and resources are continuously on. Today we live in an on-off world like early light bulbs. I go to a website, I leave it. I go to a banking service, I log in and then log out. I make a Skype phone call halfway around the world and I hang up. This is going to be a continuous environment. Hey. I don't care whether you're down the hall or 3,000 miles away. You got a minute? Great. Let's work together. Let's do something. Or a service. The same thing. Your tools and resources. And what's that going to do? That's going to mean that you're able to accomplish a lot more and get into what some of that is. Now, in static knowledge, that we're talking about knowledge systems, we've always had static knowledge. And that means that society has always been a pyramid. There's a few elites at the top, some more in the middle class, most people are at the bottom. A good example is today, there's about 1.7 billion people in the middle class, over 5 billion are on the bottom. And yet in the future, because your devices are going to know who you are, they're going to be able to restore your environment to you. What's going to happen is that the devices and the, the back-end infrastructure is going to know what people are doing. And as a result, it's going to be like GPS. How does GPS know when you put in a destination that is going to give you the choice of routes one, two, or three? Well, in the future, it, you, the network is going to evolve and it's going to know who you are, what device you're using, what, who you're connected to, what applications you're using, it's going to know what tasks you're doing and what step you're in. And by aggregating that information the same way that GPS does, it's going to be able to turn to you and at any time, optionally, you can turn to the network and say, what's the short path to my goal? And it'll be able to tell you. And so you'll be able to know how to succeed from whatever step you're doing with many things throughout what you can do with devices. And what that means is it doesn't matter whether you're in Sao Paulo or Silicon Valley. It doesn't matter whether you're in Singapore or in a small village in Africa or South America or Asia. 
everybody who has a device and is connected to the network by virtue of being connected, having a step and the knowledge of the network is going to be able to succeed as well as the best people in the world. And so what's going to happen over time is that as everybody is able to succeed upward, the pyramid that we've always had for society is going to have the opportunity for the first time to do this. And so for the very first time in history, anybody connected to the network may have the opportunity to be successful, as successful as anyone in the world. So as our new digital world begins to come into view, it affects how we live, how we earn, how we spend, how we learn, how we're entertained. And so the real question begins to become, how does this produce greatness? And the real answer, let's take one example to begin. Let's look at the security industry. Because I think the security industry is going to be, in a fully digital world, one of the world's most important, most valuable industries. And so today, let's start with where we are. Today we have external surveillance, software analysis, monitoring, and in fact, a good example of one of the advances is the Axis 2014 camera. That is inside of ATM machines. And with the back-end software, it allows the system to determine if that is an authorized user doing the transaction with the ATM machine and taking money out. If it's not an authorized user, it can stop the ATM machine from performing its, its function. We're going to move into a world that has property self-security. That access device is a good example of where we're headed. Property self-security means that if somebody is unauthorized, your devices are going to be able to protect themselves. A good example of that is your personal electronics, starting from wearables like Google Glasses and smartwatches through smartphones, tablets, laptops and PCs, television sets that are interactive and increasingly online, on up through entire wall systems so that you can actually be physically present with people in interesting new ways. So if your electronics detects that it's an unauthorized user, it can ask that user to self-authenticate. And in addition, it can do other kinds of things for example, it can contact you because it knows which the network and the back-end systems know which device you're using at that moment. It can tell you that one of your other devices, which could be your home or your car, could be some of other, your other property, or if you're in a company, it could be any of the devices that the company has connected to its network. It can say that there is something going on immediately and bridge those connections. You might recognize the person, or it might already be triggered to automatically identify the user. And then if you wanted to talk to the user, if there's two-way communications, you could do that. Or it could play recorded videos. If it has the ability, it can record video and audio. And then it can also, if there's GPS, tell you exactly where your property is. And finally, you can automatically report to the police if you choose to take that step. Property protection is going to become a built-in feature of many kinds of devices, just as music is on your smartphone, just as there's many other applications. Security can become something that is saturated throughout the physical environment. And uh, by the way, over 50 billion devices are set to be connected to the network within the next 10 to 20 years at most. But property protection is only one part of it. The next part is your personal security. Because as you have connected devices that connect you to other people, what we today take as invisible boundaries around us are going to become explicit and visible. So when they are visible and somebody seeks to cross the boundary, connect with you, become part of one of your shared spaces, could also be a service wanting to connect with you. Your boundaries and new control are going to bring in all of the information that's available and accessible to you about that person or about that service. 
And in fact, there are pieces of the technology components to value those people based upon your criteria. So based on what's important to you, which will differ in your personal life and your family from uh, your job and your work, what's important to you, these people and opportunities will be pre-valued for you. Tomorrow's kids are going to grow up in a new kind of world. It's a world where they look at the physical property around them and think of that as all protecting itself. It's a protective world. And they're going to look at the connections that they have with other people personally through their screens. They're going to have boundaries and boundary control. They're going to feel safer. And people, because of them growing up in this kind of world, are going to grow up with a new sense of value and ability to deal with things in a moral and good way. And so as that world grows up, it's going to be a future adult world that's safer to live in. And the reason I think that the security industry is not just going to be worldwide, it's going to be world changing, is because something that has always divided people is fear of other people. Fear of people that we don't know. Fear of people who are actually living in different parts of the world. They're good people. They're, they're doing their, living their lives, raising their kids, going to work every day, doing the very best that they can, that they know how to do. But people don't understand each other. In this world that we're moving into, people will be connected in lots of new ways. And we will know through these kinds of systems that the people we're dealing with almost everywhere are good people. And we will not be as afraid of each other. Let's look at the bigger picture, because we're looking at the kind of digital world that's coming. And we've talked about an individual with their own personal shared spaces. But the way it's really going to work is that people will physically be together. And together, they'll share the shared spaces. So you'll be able to be working and living with the people around you, but also have connections to many more people, services, tools, and resources simultaneously. The digital and the physical are going to grow together. And what does that mean? means, let's take an example, like when you get sick, you go to a doctor, and medical people intervene, that's what they do. And so those people will certainly be more powerful in this kind of world. But medically, as a basic human service, doctors are only a small piece of it. What actually happens to most people is that they live their lives trying to be healthy, trying to be well, trying to be better and live full lives. And now, our devices are going to be able to be aware of us. And so they're going to be able to tell, did we slip and fall? Did we have an injury? Do we need to be connected? Are we, are we beginning to get sick? And can they alert us to what they see and sense, us about, sense about us? And can they also alert other people to us, the people that care about us, the people that we care about? Do we want to know what's happening to our kids, to our spouses? So the world is going to become closer connected because services will be able to all share in helping each other in the ways that we choose to. And in addition, we're going to have 9 billion people who have to be fed, not just for decades, but for centuries to come. And so today, we have a food system that's very disconnected. Farmers want to maximize their profits, and food manufacturers that produce the products on the shelves of the stores, they want to maximize their profits in the stores, the grocery stores, and supermarkets certainly are looking to do the same. People need to find affordable, great tasting, healthy food, and it's very difficult when everybody's focused on maximizing their piece of the chain. We need to learn how to work together, and there are actually systems built in place so that as large-scale services and systems, we can all contribute to the solutions and receive the, the solutions that we develop delivered directly to us through our devices. And then that gets to the supply chain. How does the economy work? How is the economy going to work better in this kind of a digital world? And actually, today, we have orders and supplies and inventory. We're trying to match everything up, and it's very difficult. We're going to move to real-time processes with the data systems behind, keeping us alerted. In the upper left, 
you're going to have senior managers at the top who see the whole picture. And in the upper right and the lower left, you're going to have people that receive real-time alerts and can work together, both physically and digitally, all at the same time, to respond to the exceptions. And in the lower right, you're going to have automated systems like a driverless forklift up there, which is coming. All of the pieces will be able to work together for much greater efficiency, effectiveness, accuracy, and productivity. And a part of this is that it's going to affect you. You're on the left up there, but instead of getting into a car, instead of having to schedule a meeting for next Tuesday and getting the right people together and hoping all of the right people actually show up, you'll be able to go, hey, you got a minute? Or your customer will be able to say that to you. And then you and your customer, through your devices, your screens, will be able to bring up the system right away in real time. And if you need somebody from Access, like Peter was just talking about, somebody from Sweden, one of their centers around the world, an engineer, you can bring them in in real time. So suddenly, you go from having to go schedule meetings, you go to a way of working where in one day, your ability to touch more customers, to produce more revenue, for all of the people in your company to be far more productive in being able to affect change through your customers and through everything you do economically is going to multiply. And one last example of this new world is a large group, because there are many large groups around the world that are isolated from our whole world. Senior citizens are a great example, because as your parents get older, and in you, coming decades as you get older, you'll become less mobile, more isolated. And yet we know from medical research and from lots of working with people that the more senior citizens are stimulated, the more they're engaged, the more that they're connected to the people in their lives, starting from their grandchildren, through their children, through their lifetime friends, the healthier they are. And in fact, senior citizens in the future are going to be able to enjoy the treasures of the world, the world's greatest opportunities to enjoy life, as they become less mobile, as they become more isolated. And think about these large groups all over the world that have not been part of the world, but through tomorrow's networks, are not only going to be able to receive benefits, but contribute back in entirely new ways. We started this journey 10,000 years ago. And for most of that time, we've been agricultural and, at, and economically low level. But now, now that we have risen to greatness, we're going to face crises that'll make you think, if we don't find a, super, a better way to deal with them, you think your taxes are high today? You think government wants a lot from you in rules and regulations? Think about a world in crisis, a world where some of these problems really multiply because we are not solid. We're not changing who we are. We're going for it. And problems are coming. And so we either find a way to multiply our abilities and become far more effective personally and as groups and as societies, or these crises are really going to cause a lot of failures in a lot of people's lives. This new journey, this new journey is about how we interact. It's about how we work together, how we achieve our personal dreams, our societal dreams, our group dreams. As the Earth begins to become a single digital room with everybody in it, your opportunity to become personally more powerful, more capable, more interesting, and receive back from that more than has ever been done before by anybody in history is an incredible opportunity. The future of devices is about devices. The future of devices is about where we need to grow to as a world, as a society, and the opportunities that all of us will have. And I personally believe that these opportunities will come much faster than we think. 
I think this technology will, all of these technology things we've talked about today, will take a while to get started. This is the typical. It takes a while to get going. But when it hits, it's going to go. And actually, there is a map for this to go and take these technologies and build the pieces and stages so that within 10 years, this can go from new technology to establishment. And the reality of that is that when the crises of success begin to hit, when we face the need to have another option, there's something that could be waiting in the wings. And what that something is that's waiting in the wings, I think is incredible. Because I think you should just stop and think for a second. Think about the entire sweep of human history and how we have risen to becoming on the verge of a truly incredible world and society. And who are some of the most amazing people in all of human history? Who are some of the most valuable and critical and important people in all of human history? I want you to stop and look around the room. I think we are the generation that not only has to do this, but will be driven to do it, and we will do it. We are the people who have the capability of doing this. And I think the people in this room, the people in this industry, are some of the most important people in all of history. And when we get to a fully digital world, and we're all living there, I look forward to living there together with you. Thank you very much.